four parallel forks. So no static RAM, no dynamic RAM, no weird video interface. It's just four parallel forks. And two of them are on the axi bus, the full weight axi bus, and two of them are on the lightweight axi bus. Just to to show that you can use either. And also because I wanted to find out what the speed differential between the two buses is. It turns out when using a parallel port, the speed differential is about a factor of two, only about a factor of two. The, head, the full weight bus is twice as fast as the lightweight bus. So the, there's just four ports. There's an input, an output and an input. Remember, an output comes from the HPS to the FPGA. An input means from the FPGA back to the HPS. So in the code, or in the Verilog, this is going to be connected as a loop back. So the output is going to be connected to the input. Actually, the output plus one will be connected to the input just to show that it made it into the FPGA fabric. And likewise, this parallel port will be looped back to this input to the HPS. So it's kind of a minimal parallel port system. And I wanted to, uh, that, that allowed me to sort of demonstrate the addressing a little bit more. Because there's absolutely nothing on <coughs> the axi bus except two parallel ports, I can start addressing them at zero on the on the bus. And the bus the bus width is always 16 bytes for the for a for a parallel port. Why 16 bytes? Well it's four bytes per 32 bit word and there's four registers. There's a data register, a data direction register, an interrupt register, and I can't remember what the other one is, interrupt enable or something. So, so take 16 bytes to define a, a uh, PIO. So the other, so the output then is mapped to zero on the AXI bus. The input is mapped to 10, hexadecimal 10. Likewise, on the lightweight bus, the parallel port is uh, the input, excuse me, the output is mapped to zero and the input is mapped to 10. There's no overlap here because one is on the axi master and the other is on the lightweight axi master. Each master has its own address range. Advanced Extensible Interface or something. It's some acronym defined by ARM Corp. Corp. Uh, Corp. Corp. Um, consortium. Any questions on this? On this Q6. So it's really, it's really uh, the minimum I could, I could come up with that did something interesting. Now. I did two different versions of this. After, after doing this first version, I'm gonna talk about it in the second version. But the, the first version uses the University Program Parallel I.O. port, which if you were to open QSYS and click on the library up in the left-hand corner, you would find is in the University Program menu item, generic I.O. submenu, parallel port. In an attempt to make this easy to use, Altera made it confusing, as often happens. So there is a choice of boards up here, none of which match our board. Ignore it. And instead, just merely click 
create custom parallel ports. If you don't click this, it'll say, would you like to hook up the LEDs or the switches? Right, it, it, it's too much of a padded cell. So if you click this, then it overrides everything else. It just says, I want something 32 bits wide output only. And those are the only things that matter. <clears throat> Just for variety's sake, then, when I added a parallel port later on, I used the I used the version which is in the processors and peripherals menu, as opposed to the university menu. Peripherals, parallel I/O port, and this module, while it has exactly the same functionality and generates the same code has a completely different user interface. Rather, it says, this person knows what they're doing. I'm just gonna say, set the width, give a, uh, an initial value, if any, and make it input, output, or bi-directional. Done. <coughs> so you can use either one. The interfaces are slightly different. Then the Verilog shows how to how to set this up, and it's it's really straightforward. I'm going to define four signals, which are going to be connected to the output from QSIS. There's a parallel port in axis, parallel port in lightweight axis, parallel port out axis, parallel port light lightweight axis, and those are going to be connected down here in the in the interface module that, that comes from QSIS, now this is QSIS generated, the, the four signals that I'm going to interface in the outside world come out here, generated from the QSIS exported signal. So we go back and look at the QSIS again and say, wait a minute, what's he talking about? So we go down here to the parallel port output lightweight axis and I exported the, the, I exported the conduit as PP out lightweight axis. So we go back now to the Verilog snippet and we see this PP port output lightweight axis underscore export, the underscore export came from uses generation process. So once we have those signals in into the Verilog, we can do something interesting with them, or in this case, not very interesting. And that is to take the output from the HPS, add 32 tick decimal one to it, which is the default. It's 32 tick decimal is, if I just said plus one, that's what I would have gotten, but don't do that. Always specify the width. And then for debugging, I routed this through a multiplexer controlled by switch one on the board. So switch one is up, is on, you get this output loop back to the input. Otherwise, you get a zero. That allowed me to tell whether the mistakes in my code were coming because the data wasn't getting to the FPGA or was not getting back from the FPGA. And I had a bug in, in the C that, that occurs. So this was a debugging aid. Switch 2 does the same thing for the lightweight axis. And switch 0 shows me either the, the, the connection back to the HPS or the connection coming from the HPS to the AXI bus and displays it on the hex display on the board. So again, this allows me to tell whether the errors are in the input or the output. And you're probably going to want, and without recompiling it every time. So you can use the switches as, as signal routers for displaying different items on the hexadecimal display that you want to you want to explore, or you could of course route these signals to the 
I, I O header to actually look at them on the oscilloscope if they're high high speed, if they're high frequency. Any questions on this? So, sort of a minimal amount a a of logic, a combinatorial assignment, a continuous combinatorial assignment of the the output from the HPS back to the input to the HPS. Now we go over to the C, and the C program has to do a few things. I tried to organize this a little better than some of the previous examples so that you can see what's going on. The axis, the axis base in hardware is defined in hardware. You don't get to choose this as x c zero 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 zero, and I'm choosing a span of one thousand because that's bigger than anything I'm going to use in my code. One thousand span x one thousand is the smallest span you can use because you must a span must be and an integral number of blocks. And the block on this architecture is 4096 bytes. You define the uh, pointer which is going to become the virtual base, and then a couple of, of offset pointers we're going to need to actually do the read and write. You define the Lightweight base as FF200000. Again, that is hardware defined. You don't get to choose that. I'm going for the same minimum span here because I only need 32 bytes. And then also defining the necessary pointers. And just to make more readable code, I'm going to define a FPG parallel I.O. write is equal to zero because the right parallel I.O. port for both the lightweight AXI bus and the normal AXI bus are located at address zero on the bus. The offset on each of the buses for the parallel I.O. read is 10 from the Q6. So these have to, these have to match the hardware specification. This has to match the QSIS offsets that you produce. Questions? Then we do the M maps to, to link all this stuff together. So we're going to, first of all, open the, open the device, the memory device. Then we're going to M map the the FPGA lightweight base for a, a span given, and then assign the lightweight PIO pointer, which is also the right pointer, to the virtual base. And we're going to assign the read pointer to the virtual base plus the parallel IO read offset. That's 10. And then beating this to death, we're going to do the same thing for the axi base and generate two addresses for write and for read for the axi base. And then just drop into a loop which reads the reads a number from the user. I use junk for any variable I don't care about, but is, is syntactically necessary to avoid, avoid warnings. And then we're going to take this number and assign it to the, the two right addresses as output. That causes a memory operation to occur, goes through the L3 cache, the LT cache waits until the bus uh, operation is done, then returns. Then we're going to receive this back by reading the input pointers that we've previously computed in the M mapping. 
and that will print back the value. Any questions on that? Patty, you got something? You okay? Yeah. So again, this is the simplest read-write example I could come up with. To, to demonstrate mapping the QSYS bus, generating Verilog, generating C. And there's, there's, var there's variants of it. Uh, this C program, but no, with no change in the hardware or software, instead of doing one read-write, writes the whole, does N of these things, where you get to choose in interactively, I wanted to see how the, as you went from one to 10 to 100 to 1,000 to 10,000 to a million read writes, how the write rate scaled. So in a tight loop, we're just taking account, barking it out to the, to the, the FPGA. The FPGA is incrementing it in hardware and then we're reading it back in as count. So this increments, right? This is a, a very contorted way of doing an incrementer. <clears throat> that allowed me to check and make sure that the loop actually executed the correct number of times and it wasn't short-circuited or optimized away or anything. And what I found was that uh, you could do about um, 3.1 million loops per second for a large number of greater than, say, 100 loops. You can do about 3.1 million operations a second, loops per second, so that's 6.2 bus operations per million bus, op bus operations per second, and they're four bytes each, so that's 6.2 times four, it's something like 25 megabytes a second, which is a decent rate to an IO. <clears throat> then the, the final step was for your for your amusement is to just add one more parallel port on the lightweight bus in this case called parallel port out lightweight LEDs to demonstrate that what you need to do then is to Increase the offset by another factor of by, by uh, adding 16 again. So this is this parallel I/O port, port is mapped from 20 to 2 tw uh, F, and is outputted to something called axi LEDs. We then look at the Verilog snippet. The only thing we had to add to the code was one line that says take this export and signal and map it to LEDR. LEDR is an I.O. bus, predefined I.O. bus, that it hooks this signal to 10 red LEDs in the obvious um, numerical order. MMAP then just adds one more, one more value, one more port. Waits for the user to enter an LED value and dumps it out to the LED pointer. Magic happens when the lights blink, which is what we all like to do with our first microcontroller program. So, any questions on this? Pretty straightforward. So, are there any lingering pieces that you would like to see explained for lab one? For instance, the video core, or is that so hidden and abstracted away you don't care about it for this lab? Which is my guess. No, no, nothing. Well, let's talk about memory. FP. 
PGA memory. There's all kinds of different kinds of memory on the Cyclone 5 that we're using. We're using the A5, that's why I circled that with my best Photoshoppy lips. There's 85,000 logic elements which are grouped into 32,000 uh, advanced logic modules. <coughs> If you converted all of it, of all of this to RAM, you could you could store about 128,000 bits. Don't do that, because then you can't film anything. There's hard IP in the form of N M10K blocks on this on this architecture, and there's about just under 400 M10K. Each one of which will store about exactly 256 32 bit words. There's also some things called M Labs, which we'll talk about in a minute. There's 480 M Labs. M Labs are a group, a cluster of ALMs, of, of logic modules, that can be twisted in such a way that their lookup tables become RAM. And you can then use them as slightly higher density memory for things like register sets for CPUs. They're perfect for high speed register sets for CPUs. That's what they're, I think they're meant for. Then there's these variable precision DSP blocks we'll talk about later. There's 87 of them, but you can break each one of those down into two 18 by 18 multipliers. Which is probably what you'll do for the drum, for a latitude of the drum. So, M10K blocks, about 390 blocks. They can be arranged at each block separately to be arranged as one bit by 8K, two bits by 4K, four bits by 2K, five bits by 2K, eight bits, 10 bits, 16, 20, and 32, and 40 bits. So you can specify in your Verilog different widths as long as they fall into one of these categories. And the system will build memory using M10K blocks. You can, but there are, there's a, several ways of inferring an M10K block. One is to build it using Verilog. Another is to use it, is to use the Alt Mem module uh, IP from Altera, and the third way is to instantiate NSRAM on QSYS, in which case QSYS will prompt you for the width and number of words. If you try and build a memory that's bigger than this, Verilog or QSYS just concatenates blocks, takes care of all the addressing, multiplexing for you, and builds you a bigger memory. So it just automatically happens. One thing to watch out for is that there are pipeline registers on the data address and write enable lines. So that effectively an M10K block takes read takes two cycles. One to load the the input buffer register and another cycle to read the memory contents. Two cycles to read, unless you choose output buffering, and then it's three cycles. Why in the world would you do that? Why would you do that? Why would you slow down memory? Does it? What if you pipeline it? In fact, you can pipeline reads and get one read out per cycle after the first read. So you can pipeline reads. I tend not to do that because I like simple solutions, you know, easier to debug. So I tend not to pipeline. 
A re, a write, on the other hand, happens in one cycle. You can, you, uh, M10K blocks also support true dual port memory. So you can do arbitrary combinations of two reads, two writes, or read to write on each cycle to each memory block. Now, there's some interesting things that happen when you do that. For instance, if you try and read the same memory location off of one port that you're writing on the other port. What should happen? I don't know. That's not well defined, and it's totally undefined if the clocks are different. It is not in principle understandable. Don't do that. Don't read and write the same memory location at the same time. Undefined. MLAB blocks can hold uh, a, a limited number of 32-bit words. Um, they're not necessarily clocked, so they can be continuously read. You give it an address, it statically gives you back um, data. I don't tend to use them. I like uh, M10K blocks better. I have some examples that use them. You can also if you're absolutely desperate, use logic element registers to store a limited amount of data. Let's say if you need a pipeline register for a solver for the for a, for a, for a, the drum equations that we're going to be doing, or you need a pipeline register for for uh, or you need a register that can be cleared asynchronously then you have to use logic elements because M10K blocks have no global clear. Any questions on this? So there's lots of, there's a fair amount of memory. You can do a lot of I.O. at once. You can issue up to <clears throat> one read-write, two read-writes per clock per M10K block. So you could do around 800 read-writes per cycle. If only you could figure out how to organize the data so that makes sense. You've got a lot of I.O. bandwidth, memory bandwidth for these things. Now they're fast memory. There's a bunch of coding style recommendations, and you probably are going to want to read this. The, uh, the HDL style guide, I find very useful. You should probably read it, or at least go through and know where the sections are. For instance, inferring multipliers and DSP functions, that could be very useful for the next lab. Has very long of VHDL if you're of that persuasion. Don't use VHDL. Inferring RAM functions from HDL code using synchronous RAM blocks. All of the avoid unsupported reset and control conditions. So these give you the fine print about what M10K blocks can and cannot do. Basically, there's no global operations on memory. There's no global clear on a memory. If you if you insist on global clear, then you will get logic elements as memory. And we get down here someplace and we'll find single clock synchronous. Oh, let's do single clock synchronous RAM with new data read during write behavior. You could do that with a single clock and a single port. Single, single, simple dual port, dual clock, synchronous RAM. But rather than plow through this, I, 
copied it out to here. So if you make a module of this format that has some width of output, doesn't have to be 8 bits, could be 32 bits, some width of input, some width of write address and read address, depending on how many bits or how many words you want, a write enable and two clocks, and you follow this format exactly, then Verilog, the Verilog compiler in Cordis, will infer M10K blocks for you. The nice thing is that it infers the hardware on the FPGA and it simulates correctly. So this is kind of a nice way to infer memory. You declared a declared a memory array. Sooner or later, I'll have to find out from the system manager what the password is for updating that. <laughs> so you're inferring, you, you, de you declare a memory array. This happens to be 128 words, 7 bits of 8-bit memory. And on the positive clock edge, it has to be synchronous. On the positive clock edge, if the right enables high, it writes it. On the on the positive clock edge of two, it reads what is already in this in memory and then updates the memory register. So there's a pipeline in first place. <clears throat> there's an example towards the end of this page. Uses that uses QSIS RAM M10K blocks and MLAB to do some stupid function like pass a value around the loop of the three memories and put it back out again. But it shows how to instantiate each type of memory and how to like, build a state machine which uses that. One thing you can do when trying to build memory is that you can specify a RAM style so that if you want to give Verilog a hint about the kind of memory to use, then <clears throat> you can. For instance, you could tell it no read write check. That says, I'm smart enough, I'm never going to read and write from the same address, so don't even bother to generate logic to keep me from doing that. Saves, saves logic. Usually, I usually do no read write check. Then you get to specify the kind of block, M910, K, M20K, M144K, MLAP. Oh, great. M10K is on this list. If you use the wrong kind of memory, it won't work because that type of memory doesn't work on our FPGA. The only time we have is M10K. So the format, again, is this weird thing. You on the line where you declare the memory, so that's 8-bit memory, it's uh, uh, 64 words of 8-bit memory, you have to put a comment either before this, this, this declaration or after the declaration. And this comment, the synthesis directive, forces Verilog to use the style of memory which you specify. I often do that just to make sure I haven't messed up, so I often force M10K, but not always. There's lots of other synthesis attributes you can choose.
direct enable, full case, keep, max fan, max dev, multi style, blah, blah, blah. RAM init file, oh, nice. You can, you can embed in the, in the specification of a, so we go down here to the details, RAM init file. So when you declare a memory, you can declare the name of a memory image file that you want Cordis to load into that memory when the FPGA is programmed. In other words, you can build a custom ROM that way, where the custom ROM is built on the PC and then downloaded at, at load time, at compile time, to the FPGA. <coughs> so in the, in the fullness of time, you're going to want to read through the, the various ROM style, RAM style, various other uh, synthesis attributes you can use, but if you're fairly careful and use a format that looks like this, you will get M10K blocks on our architecture. There's no specification. So when you say a format that looks like this, what? You could change the size and number of bits. You could change the, the number of words in memory. You can change the names of anything. But there has to be a structure which is clocked, which copies data into a memory address, and which copies data out of an address with this pipeline. You're probably going to need it for, for lab two, because part of lab two is an optimization to be able to compute as many nodes of a simulated drum as possible in a given time constraint, which is one audio cycle at 48 kilohertz, so call it 20 microseconds, 21 microseconds. So there's going to be a trade-off between memory, number of compute units, and how many nodes each compute unit actually computes. Because you don't want to compute too few nodes and waste time. But you can't use more memory than you have memory, and you can't use more multipliers than you have multipliers. So there's going to be all kinds, there's going to be some very interesting constraints on arithmetic, memory, logic, and time that you have to optimize. I'll give you some idea. I mean, I'm not going to hide this from you. I'll, I'll tell you the, the best optimization I've seen on this. But that's going to be part of the exercise, is to build a big drum. As a finite difference approximation of the nonlinear wave equation. I like to relate these exercises back to physics. I think it's good idea because it kind of slaps some of those neurons about that you haven't used for a long time when you have to think about the wave equation. So it right, relates it back to ECE 3030 kind of feel to it. So Check out. Second, second week checkoff starts tomorrow. Has anybody got quick compile to work on with uh, single tap? I never have. That's right. I never have. I don't know what. I don't know what's required. Anybody using Ola? That's a that's a definite maybe if ever I saw it. Okay, so in some ways Ola compiles faster than single tap because it's smaller, but it's up to you to decide. It's 
less general. That's why it's smaller. Yes? I forgot to write down how we're actually supposed to shut down the system so we don't break it. Well, so you're going to want to look at this link, which is called Linux on HPS. And after some general stuff, one of the first things it says is, the right corrupting the file system is shut down dash H now. Don't turn off the power. Most of the time it'll work. And once in a while, it will destroy your SD card. You've all backed up? How many people have backed up the SD card? Good. Do it. Because you will blow it out. I've blown out two or three. And I haven't even tried to mo modify the kernel yet. That's coming down the line someplace, but not yet. Okay. Uh, I'll see you some. I'll, see, I'll be in lab this afternoon and every Wednesday afternoon as required. If nobody shows up, I'll leave again. If people are there, I'll talk. And uh, so. <coughs>